get to say good morning too. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> um, if I can speak for Steph a little bit, who uh, the Lord directed her to do these night watches for five weeks, um, 11 to five. Uh, please don't feel pressure to like fill it up and be like, oh, you know, we need to like set times. Um, it's really a vision for having open, flexible time. And if the Lord's like, ooh, ooh, you know, you got to do this. Um, and you're like, ooh, ooh, the Lord's telling me, feel free to let her know, but don't feel like it's like, hey, there's six hours. I need to take a chunk, you know, and like officially establish that. Um, it, there is a vision for letting the time really flow with the Spirit with everybody who's directed to come here for that time. Does that make sense? I know um, our, like, our weeks are run by these like carefully appointed times the Lord's given us to keep and um, for these hours with given people and um, uh, but the, the night watches are have been given to her as a fluid thing. So so definitely speak up with what the Lord's telling you about. Let her know about the night watches. Just don't feel like it's got to be all covered. Um, is that okay? I didn't need to talk to you about doing that. But I was like, I have an opportunity to talk here. And it's not at all. Yes, yeah. It's expanding. Because by all means, if you're like, you know, I want to, for an hour, I, I really want to like lead us like worship for an hour, let her know. Just didn't want anybody to think that, oh, we got to like start making a schedule and filling it in. And I, I got to take a spot because there's a gap, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, let's see. So the Lord this morning was like, do your notes in a completely different order. So <laughs> this will be... Fun. Um, and Lord, just help me uh, to follow what you're saying and not get lost. Uh, by the way, there is uh, a place on the website called Prayer Room Basics. I don't know if, do you all know this? Tom has actually portioned and collected some messages in a part of the website that's prayer room basics. And it has um, foundational messages that were given by various ones from the Lord to establish this place, to sort of set um, vision and parameters for how the prayer room works and why the prayer room um, and then there's also a set of messages that are from one voice, which was specifically a targeted let's get together and talk about how the prayer room flows and let's even do activation exercises into what was being preached. Those are there. So um, if you're like, I want to touch base with some of the beginnings, you'll see lovely unpainted wood paneling in some of the messages, even they're that old. Uh, and the stage not set up how it is now. But... Uh, They'd, they'd be a great place to touch base if you're like, you know what, I need reminders or I need like a little crash course in prayer room basics. Um, those are there and available. And there's also, there's a lot more um, through YouTube, through messages. Um, that, and there, Tom's done a bunch of organizing on those too. So there's groups of like stuff that the Lord's speaking through. You can kind of one person um, what he's released through one person. You can see kind of grouped messages. You can see topical stuff. So those are all available. Um, yeah. Thanks, Tom, for doing all of that. And uh, I don't, it just thought the Lord was like, maybe people don't even know this resource is there, but it is. Um, and one of the reasons I think I'm sharing that is because I'm just seeing the way the Lord is orchestrating what he's saying through all of us. Um, it, you know, you look at the schedule and it feels a little weirdly popcorn 
And it's like this person's talking, and this person's talking, and that person's talking, and then like this person's talking two weeks in a row, or you know, two times with a space in between, and it kind of looks random, but it's amazing how he's just sort of threading things through. And there are, um, he is giving us like line upon line messages where uh, messages lead into other messages, they build on each other, and they're more than just any one message because they actually, he is growing something across them. And then he's doing it through us too. Like, um, I really feel like uh, Jen, when she was like, can I get on two times in one month because I got like a two-part thing that the Lord's building and um, it'd be good to put them close enough together that I can do that. And then what the Lord's been talking about to, from, to me for today, I think fits right in the middle actually connects to those, he does that, and yet at the same time, it's like the fourth part of what I thought was going to be a one, one single message that became a three-part message, and now it's uh, kind of a fourth part. So, which is just to say, hallelujah, Lord, thank you for, um, that you are speaking. You are speaking through many voices, but you are speaking your one heart. Um, and I just want to, Lord, ask that we even see more how you're building up and saying something that not any one of us could say on our own. Um, and we just, we just want to see all the pieces because together they all are you. Holy Spirit, would you come and reveal it? Amen. So uh, the three-part message was about the priesthood of believers, and the ambassador location. So I'm still talking about core values. Speaking of our website, we also have a page that's core values that are um, like prophetically given. These are the values that were formed at the beginning of Light Hub. The Lord was like, these are foundational to what you're doing to the prayer room, um, to what I've called you to. And we've recently gone back through them. Um, the Lord led us to make a few changes um, and sort of update them to what he's saying now and to what we see now because we've had uh, over a half decade of waiting and hearing and asking him about the things he originally gave us. And he's clarified some because we don't hear um, perfectly. And... There are things that he's like, this is important, and you didn't really say it explicitly. Make it more explicit. Um, this you said in a way that I'd like to tweak so that it's clearer about what I was actually saying to Light Hot. So, um, and then he said, go back through, and I've got a series of things to say about these. So this, this is building off of that. Um, I'm going to go back to... Our core value, which is to establish Kalamazoo as a city of refuge and an ambassador location of the kingdom government of Jesus Christ. Uh, not because this message is about that, but it's going to build from it. Because I did talk about that for the first, in, over the first three. Um, and I go back to that because the first thing that we tend to think of when we think of a prayer room is a bunch of people praying for Things. Intercession, basically. It's kind of the first place we go in our heads. It's the first place the charismatic church kind of goes with prayer. Um, you know, we look at people who are, and, and we see that they've really got a heart for prayer, and what do we call them? We call them intercessors, right? We go to this one aspect of what prayer is. Um, and if you go to a group prayer meeting, in most charismatic churches, what you're going to get is a lot of people interceding, praying for other people. Uh, it's kind of our default, what we expect, right? You get a bunch of people together to pray. They're going to pray about this trouble in the earth and that trouble in the earth and these people who are really having a hard time and need something. Um, and it's in our core vision to do that. That is part of, um, we, we do believe that the Lord is, um, works out in this place on our prayers. And we've seen some amazing things praying. Um, I've seen news stories the next day about something the Lord told me to pray that I didn't even realize really was a thing. 
and then the very next day in a news story about something around the earth, something dramatic happens that he actually touches. So there's, there's, um, it is part of that. It is part of the expression of the ambassador location for Jesus' kingdom that we hear what he's decreeing into the earth and we're an expression of it. We agree with it in prayer and then he moves at the sound of our voice. But I want to talk about like the foundation of that, that that is actually a slice of prayer and it is built on other prayer that goes before. Left alone to its own devices, if all we do is intercession, we just open up a playground for the flesh to try to change the world. This is actually, you know, this is every kind of um, religious mystical prayer movement will go here. You know, we gather together, we get excited about something changing, and we believe that it changes, whether it's um, other religions, whether it's witchcraft. There's nothing sort of unique in let's get together and agree real hard about something, and it'll change. Um, but in the prayer room of the Lord, there is a unique expression. So let's go to Job 42. In Job 42, 7. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you've not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For I'll accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you've not spoken of me what is right as my servant, Jacob, or as my servant Job has. So he sets up, he says, you know, here's... Like, the Lord himself is telling somebody face to face, the, this man is going to pray for you. I am appointing him as an intercessor for you, which just means that he's going to pray on behalf of somebody else. He's going to stand between us. And he says, why? He's spoken of me what is right. What is different between Job and his friends? He actually spent, and I talked about this a while back in a Job message, that he uniquely among his friends was like, I want to talk to the Lord instead of talking about the Lord. Um, his friends spent a lot of time talking about God without ever saying, let's talk to God. And Job spent the whole time going, I just want to talk to him. Now, did Job, was Job perfect in the whole thing? No, he was rebuked by the Lord, right? So when the Lord says, he said what was about me, what is right, he says something right at the beginning and then he says something right at the end after he's chastened by the Lord. And in the middle, he's got a little bit of wobbly. Um, but the, the reason that he says something right about the Lord in the end is because he's like, I got to talk to God and see what he's got to say to me. And when God does talk to him, he's like, oh. And he says what is right before the Lord. And that puts him in the place of now the Lord's going to accept his intercession for somebody else because he's received correction from the Lord. He's aligned himself. He's tuned himself to the Lord. And this is, you know, what an ambassador does, right? An ambassador has to connect to the government that they're representing and be like, what's your will? Right? Ambassadors don't go into the earth going, you know what? We've decreed this. They talk. They don't have the right to go around deciding what's right for their country. They talk to the people who actually do, to the government. They get that connection, that understanding, and then they can go and talk to uh, the nation that they're talking to, that they're representing on their home nation to. Then they can express um, what's truly the will of the government they're representing. They also need to know 
about the country that they're um, in, that they're ministering to on behalf. They have a connection there of, I understand who you are, and I understand how your things work so that I can talk to you in a language that you understand. So uh, Romans, let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8, 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. And now, Jesus had no sin in him, but he did walk as us to know. I mean, he knows intimately what it is to be human and to walk, and yet he is perfectly um, in the Father's will. So he is our example of perfect intercession, of going to the cross on our behalf. Um, Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He's put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. This is amazing. Um, what an amazing gift Isaiah was given to see this mystery so long before it would actually be fulfilled in the earth by Jesus. Um, so we see the foundation of intercession right here is that Jesus bore our punishment for our sins in that place of um, drinking the cup that the Father had given him to drink, being completely God and yet, knowing what it is to be completely man as well, he could stand in the middle. Um, the uniquely glorious thing about him is that he not only is a measuring line that judged us because he was righteous and it judges all our unrighteousness set next to him, which was the purpose of the law to set up a measure that we would measure against and realize we fall short of. But he also provided his blood to cover that, to heal that distance. How glorious is that to be both the judgment and the mercy at the same time? Um, the Lord's been talking to me a lot about measuring lines or um, tuning, about not setting our own measuring line against this house um, because we can't measure correctly, and he does, that we have to let him do the measuring and see where things are off plumb um, because only he can which kind of speaks to this, how do you go and intercede for the earth trying to fix what's wrong if you don't have the true measuring line already set up to see what's off plumb? That's where you can get into pure flesh, trying to fix all the things because you're trying to set things to your plumb line. 
which is always going to be crooked without the Lord. Um, it's the, you know, we, as a group of musicians, you have some kind of authoritative measure of what tune is. You've got the piano that you play or the pitch pipe or the tuning fork or um, something that gives you the correct that everybody else goes, I'm, are you laughing at my archaic or electronic things that read, you know, yes. Uh, yes, very old, old tools for, for pitch um, or the electronic thing that reads it. Uh, you have some kind of thing that you measure it because if you have a bunch of people and they're all just trying to measure off of each other, it's going to be a big old mess. But you get that one authoritative pitch and everybody's like, ah, I know what we're at and we go forward and we sing beautifully together. Um, so let's go to, uh, I have to go to, I have to go back to the beginning. So what really, what, what he gave me as the core value to talk about today is to commit to looking at the face of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and then to be transformed into his image. And this is the plumbing of our hearts that actually allows a pure intercession to come out. Which is to say that this kind of prayer, um, beholding and becoming, is foundational for all of the other prayer. Starting with the beholding. Um, okay. Let's go to Psalm 115. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name. Give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. So that uh, there's actually two psalms that both specifically talk about people becoming like the idols. Because we are designed to behold and become the, like the thing that we look at, that we gaze at, that we worship. Um, and so when we pick the wrong things to look at, we actually plumb ourselves to those things and become like them. And setting up an idol, which has no life in it, we become death, as opposed to looking to the Lord, in which we set ourselves against him and become more and more life and light. Second Corinthians 3, starting in verse 12. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed in the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So by his word we see him, and by his word, um, not just his written scripture, but by his word expressed out prophetically, we see him and we become more like him. It's the same principle as becoming more like the idols. The spirit, we have the spirit who reveals. So um, Jesus came and showed us a perfect, sinless life and became a measure against which we can be set and judged according to. 
while also becoming the covering for that gap between his plumb line and us. And then he poured out his spirit to take us through the entire process of sanctification so that we get corrected into that plumb line, so that we get made plumb over time. Um, I love... I love the thought that uh, this is actually what the Spirit loves to do, is reveal the Son to us. Uh, I think, Tom, somebody, there was some prayer slash singing about it earlier. Um, And if you can think about, like, think about your acts of service that you're like, okay, I know I'm supposed to do this, and and it'll love this person, and I love this person, so I'm going to do it. There's a bunch of those things. But... Um, you think about, think about the things that, like, when somebody's like, hey, could you? You're like, ooh, I love doing that. You know, it's not even like, you don't even have to be like, Lord, give me strength to help this person. You know, I, there are things that are like, I just, you know, I'll make some cookies for this thing that's happening because I just love baking or, you know. I just, I love it when I can turn my brain off and just give somebody some, the labor of my hands as long as they tell me what to do, right? Um, whatever it is for you, that, that thing where you're like, oh, I'm so glad you asked because that's just an awesome thing. I just delight in doing. Like, that's the Holy Spirit when we're like, come show us Jesus. It's like, I was hoping you'd ask that because that's the kind of thing, I, that's the what I love to do. And it makes it such a wonderful thing to ask him when you realize that, you know, when you're like, he's just waiting for me to ask this because it's like, yes, another opportunity. He loves the son that much that he's like, okay, somebody, somebody asked me to show the son. Psalm 16, 6. Which came out in the worship and prayer time today too. Psalm 16, 6, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. I'll bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My heart also instructs me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in shale, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You'll show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasure evermore. So, um, not that long ago, the Lord talked to me and I shared about uh, really the unfolding of adoration in the house of prayer. That he was saying that he's going to teach it to us and increase it in the house. And really, this is the foundation on all the other prayer that comes out, is the looking at his face and seeing how beautiful and amazing and kind and loving and um, merciful and generous he is, and how holy and how powerful. Because you can't really do any of the other prayer without that. If that's not there, We've just got a lot of soulish stuff going on. There has to be a desire to see him. And why do I say that? Because we can't even do the repentance thing unless we see him. Left unto ourselves, like I said at the beginning, that the law, right, was given for us to measure up against, to see where we were at, to lead us to repentance. And Paul writes about if there wasn't any law, there would be nothing to measure against, and it'd be like, yeah, whatever, right? Jesus was given to us to measure against, to say, oh, look how beautiful and perfect he is. And then we can see where we are when he reveals 
This is the difference between us, and then we can repent. If there's no seeing him, if there's no beholding the perfection of him, how do you repent for falling short of it? But that's the next that's built on top of. So we have um, beholding, just seeing his beauty. And then we see that distance. And then we can mourn that distance in the hope, in the assurance that he has covered that distance in his blood and that he has poured out his spirit in order to draw us across that distance to him. And here, um, you know, what, what is David looking around at and going, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. He's looking around. This is a prayer for the prayer room. This is for the presence of the Lord, the place of beholding. He's like, this is good. I've been given something beautiful. Is the place where I can come look at you. Uh, Romans 8, 26. <laughs> Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And this is why... um, we do emphasize to each other over and over again the need to be spirit-led in the prayer room, um, the need for prophetic in the prayer room is because the spirit, we don't know what to pray in our own flesh, in our own understanding, but over time, he works his image in us. He teaches us what to pray. And that comes out of that process of looking at him seeing his perfection, seeing how I fall so fall short of it, repenting, receiving his blood, receiving the correction of my heart, and then wanting that for others is what leads us into intercession. This beautiful, sometimes I just feel this beautiful feast before us and feel like, There's so much more food than we can eat. And it's so lovely to sit down and eat it together. But knowing that there are so many chairs that could be filled, that there's such a place of peace in a world that needs it so desperately. Uh, Steph and I pray with Elisha and Alia weekly in an Israel set on Wednesday night, which is a test of all of this. I mean, every prayer set is. I'm just speaking out of my personal experience. Um, And what I've, yeah, what I've learned doing it. Um, If you've ever been here for that set, you'll often hear me start off asking for Holy Spirit direction because I'm acutely aware of it's a, it's a little bit of a fear of the Lord when it comes to Israel, just because I know it's the apple of his eye. I know that poking Israel, that taking advantage of her for um, selfish reasons is like uniquely offensive to him. And so I really don't want to get up and pray prayers that are right out of my flesh. And uh, so I'll often open that way and... It is a test, and I'm sure any of you that have a prayer set that's uniquely sort of intercessory in its um, 
it's thrust, right? We have different prayer sets that um, have different, okay, this is what this is dedicated to, and ones that are uniquely intercessory. Um, there's a challenge in them because how do you not spend an hour sort of outward focused and forget about the work that's the foundation, which is beholding him and letting him change us first before we ask him to change anything else. Um, I do a lot of praying for what I hear the Lord saying for Israel, for Israel, also meaning it for me and us. And then Stephanie, as the worship leader of the set and prophetic singer, will prophetically sing something that sounds like she's praying, singing a prayer for herself while actually also praying for Israel. And that was a lovely thing to discover in the process of going, okay, how are we going to pray for Israel? Is that like every prayer set out in these sets should, from our heart, be about change me while I'm asking you to change something else. I can, I, I've seen it. Um, sometimes we stumble over, like, we come up and we pray something for ourselves in a set that we know has an intercessory topic. And we're like, oops, did we just go off topic, you know? And then there are times um, where it goes the other way around, where we're like praying out, and then we're like, oops, have I forgotten, you know, this work of, of the prayer room? Um, and yet there is, there is a place to be found where it's both and the whole time through where you are meaning both. And, and the Lord knows. So um, do, do be released from trying to explain to people. We don't really need to be like, I'm going to come up here and pray for you know, the salvation of the Orthodox. And by the way, just to let you know, I know I need to, you know? Like, the flesh wants to do that, right? Um, or I just came up and was like, Lord, you know, in the middle of the persecuted set, Lord, give me strength to endure. But, oh, by the way, everybody, I know I don't have it as bad as they do, and I'm really praying for them too. It's okay, you know? The Lord knows. And if you know in the Lord, go ahead. Pray out what he's given you. Um, Okay, let's see. One of the beautiful things is it is it is a loop. So it's not like we behold him, we're like, oh yeah, I know who God is now. I'm graduated on to, oh, look at me, I'm mourning the difference. Would you deal with it? Okay, I've graduated from that, now I can do intercessory prayer. Um, it keeps going, and one of the things I've discovered is you do get to the place of, I'm praying some intercession, and I realize I'm actually praying amiss because I want to bless people in a completely fleshly way that shows I need to go back here a little bit and let him deal with that. I don't know, has anybody else noticed sometimes it's easier to pray for enemies? Um, it is easier, easier to pray spirit-led for somebody who is persecuting a Christian, for me, sometimes. Because I have to go, Lord, what's your heart for this person who is doing horrible, vile things to my brothers and sisters? And I can pray about encounter with him and all of the deep things of God that are real blessings. But if I know, oh, this person's being persecuted, my initial response is, Lord, you know, get rid of those people who are doing bad things to my brothers and sisters. It's really easy to go there. And that's where I'm like, wait a minute. Is that really what I want for me? Is that really what would bless me is to have all of the difficulty go away? And so I can go back and I can repent of that distance and then I can pray, write prayers as for, which is not to say that sometimes the Lord doesn't want us to pray for healing 
or for protection from, from persecution or, um, you know, any of the negative things. It's just we know that the real, the real deep root blessing is heart change, is being right with him, whether or not the circumstances change. Um, it definitely is challenging. This is definitely one of those when we get up and I'm praying for Israel and asking that they bless his judgments, that they see his judgments rightly and receive them as his good, as um, love and mercy. You know, that, that definitely needs some prayer that I've gone through that I do that first. Um, before I can pray that rightly. And every time I pray it, it does test me of whether or not I really believe that for myself. So there's this beautiful circuit of these three kinds of prayer um, that keep us coming back to this change. One of the tests, I think, definitely, of... Um, whether we're praying out of this heart thing is when we are praying for people who are set against each other and whether we fall into a side in that prayer. Do we mourn and pray on behalf of the persecutor as much as we do the persecuted? Do we pray as much on behalf of the authorities that are... Um, just doing wicked things as we do the people under their rule? Do we identify with them? Do we come into this place going, you know, Lord, I know that I am called to persecution in you because it's just part of being part of your body. And so I can identify, I can pray for the persecuted church knowing that I'll feel that someday. Um, we identify. Do we identify as much and go, Lord, I know in me is a persecutor. In me is the sin that would lash out. Do we, you know, pray for people who are being um, burdened by religious leaders, identifying with them as much as we identify with, I, I can totally bind other people because that's in me. So, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. And I want to link it in specifically to the prayer room and how we do we, what we do here and why. First Corinthians 14, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation. And he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets, that the church may receive edification. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an unclean, uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of language in the world, and none of them was without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may be interpret. 
For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I'll pray with a spirit and I'll also pray with understanding. I'll sing with a spirit and also sing with understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with a spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you're saying? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. So um, the, the space, the prayer room is specifically set up to be a conversation, not each of us individually with the Lord, but all of us together. We specifically set up any set where there's prayer going on with at least two people so that there's a back and forth happening. And um, I think it's, it's easy to see in Paul's letter to the Corinthians a desire for love among the believers for kindness and gentleness and self-control all from a place of, you know, like that's what we should be exhibiting, right? That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what those who believe in Christ should reflect like. Um, but I think he's also very concerned about the expression of God in their midst, of actually hearing the word of the Lord, actually the beholding and becoming that comes out of a people doing it together, not individually. Um, not one person doing it all and everybody spectating. Of actually creating that flow because we all see in part, we all prophesy in part, which means if we're not together doing it, we're just getting a part of the beholding which means we're just getting a part of the becoming. But a prayer room set in order where there is antiphony, where there are many voices expressing, creates a fullness of picture of him and draws us into a becoming that's more of a fullness. Jumping down to 26, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there's no interpreter, let him keep silent in church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And he's even, he's careful to say, like, I'm not forbidding tongues. It's not a problem with the tongues. It's a problem of individualism, of why, what are you doing when you come together? It's a problem of, you know, the person's being edified. There is, there's some beholding and becoming of an individual speaking in tongues just before the Lord. It is a beautiful um, individual thing. But there is something bigger that is in the purpose of the prayer room of us all talking to the Lord together and in that all becoming something more than just any one of us doing it. Uh, Psalm 36 is response leaders, leader. <laughs> Would you come on up? We, um, there's, there's not a lot of confession of sin, even though the word commands it in the traditions of the body of Christ. And where there is a tradition of it, it's let's go hide it away between two people, you know, between a priest, um, so that it's super 
safe, you know, and that um, someone can tell you it's okay. You can be given something to do to make it feel like you've worked out the sin. We have this beautiful, rare thing here where we are repenting before each other. Um, and in that process, rather than one person getting free, you know, I, I think we've all experienced, you know how it is when somebody comes up and really repents and it opens a way for you to do likewise. You're, it unlocks something. Um, we see him together. We see ourselves together. And there is a freedom in it, um, a growth in it that that's not the same. It's not the same as going to one, you know, close counselor and being like, hey, I've got a struggle going on. Um, there's so much mercy in it and grace. Psalm 36, 5, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They're abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house. And you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. O continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. So Lord, I, I want to ask again, would you, would you pour out a grace? One of the graces I'm asking for in these months that you've said there is grace available is for adoration. It's for seeing you and just proclaiming what we see. Lord, um, in your light, we see light. We want, we want to grow into it. We want to go from glory to glory and grace to grace, seeing you. I just thank you for this foundation that you have laid. I thank you for the hearts of intercession that have grown out of it and the maturity in intercession that's growing out of it. Lord, would you continue to just uh, establish a mature prayer in this place that is all prayer, not just a portion, that is all the expression of you talking with us and us talking with you. Cause you